This week's parsha commences with the accounting of all the contributions that were made by the Jewish people, as was mentioned last week, and how they were used in the manufacture of the various items that were used in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, together with the Mishkan itself. Parsha commences by saying, Eile Pukudei HaMishkan Mishkan Ha'edut. These are the countings of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of testimony. One of the great Torah commentators, a man by the name known as the Orachaim HaKodesh, the Holy Orachaim, comments and says that when we talk about accounting, Eile Pukudei, these are the countings of the contributions that were made. And he points out that when it comes to making a reckoning, an accounting, of our own wealth, of our own value, if you will, this is the only true accounting that actually exists, Elip Kudei, the accounting of that which we gave. This fundamental principle is seen in a beautiful story illustrated by the famed Rab Don Isaac Barbanel. Don Isaac Barbanel was a gentleman, a great rabbi, who lived in the 15th century in Spain and was actually a the financial advisor, he was the Minister of Finance to none other personages than the King and the Queen than Ferdinand and Isabella, those infamous individuals who ultimately expelled the Jewish people from Spain and brought about the Spanish Inquisition. Don Isaac Abarbanel was called by the King on one occasion, because there were many people who were opposed to him. By virtue of the fact that he was so successful, so close with the king, and had the king's ear at any time, it has inspired the ire and the jealousy of so many people that they conspired on regular occasions to try and have him ousted, if not executed. On this occasion, they suggest to the king that Don Isaac of Barbanel is in actual fact stealing from the government and that if one were to make an, a reckoning of his possessions, you would in actual fact be able to see it, that perhaps he wasn't paying his dues, he wasn't paying his taxes. And the king calls him in, even though he was his trusted advisor, and says, Don Isaac, I want you to give forth a total reckoning and accounting of everything that you, that you own. And he says, I shall certainly do so. And he goes home, and he goes through all his books and he comes back with a certain figure. When he presents that to the king, the king is crestfallen. And he says, my dear friend, now I know for sure that you are in fact a thief and that you've been lying. Don Isaac is taken aback. He says, why so? And the king says, because I well know that just your properties alone far exceed the value that you have placed here in this ledger. And that excludes all your other items that you possess, the cash that you have. There's no question that you're lying. And Don Isaac of Barbanel responded and he said, You didn't really ask me how much I am worth. You didn't ask me how much I own. But rather you wanted to know what my value was. And therefore I brought a reckoning, not of what indeed I possess at this moment in time, but rather that which I possess for all eternity. And he said, you see, Your Majesty, you're right, I do own all those properties, and I do have a tremendous amount of material wealth that I possess in various different forms. But who knows what tomorrow will bring. Tomorrow, possibly, Your Majesty will decide to confiscate all of my properties, to take all of my money away. So tomorrow, in actual fact, I may be absolutely worthless. And even should Your Majesty not choose to do that, who says that tomorrow I will be around to have these possessions? And therefore, when you ask me what is my worth, I can only give you that which I have, not in this world, but in the world to come. And that, Your Majesty, I reckoned by virtue of the charity that I gave, the tzedakah. And that is what I presented with you on the ledger. That, Your Majesty, is beyond the grasp of any king, 
they can never take it away from me. And even if the angel of death should come and take his life away, Don Isaac of Barbanel will indeed take this value that he possesses with him to the world to come. One of the great Sephardi commentators, a man by the name of the Benish Chai, articulated this with a beautiful and interesting analogy. And he gave the following parable. A father comes to his son to try and see and test the acumen of the child. And he says to him, tell me, there are nine birds sitting on the wall. I take an arrow and I shoot and hit the one bird. How many birds are left on the wall? So the child immediately responds and he says, one. The father is aghast. The child can't even do a simple mathematical equation of nine minus one and get to eight. So he says, no, you're wrong, my son. There would be eight remaining on the wall. And the son turns around and he says, no, my father. He says, because the moment that you shot that arrow and you killed that bird, the other eight flew away. And the only bird that is remaining is the one that is here that you shot. And says the Ben Ishchai, this is in actual fact this idea. The idea that the possessions that we have can fly away in a moment. They're here today and gone tomorrow. And if ever we needed to understand this, all we have to do is look back to when the financial meltdown occurred internationally. Thank God it didn't affect South Africa to the same degree. But people who were worth millions, all of a sudden, it all disappeared and vanished. And yet people who took those millions while they had it and donated it to have institutions, donated it to establish shuls, to establish a mikveh, to establish a school, they didn't lose that money. That money is still there. Not only is it there in those institutions that they founded, but it is there with them, not only in this world, but in the world to come. When they go up to Shemaim after 120 years, when they return their holy soul to God, it's the only cash that we can take with us. The mitzvah that we did with it. That's the only thing that's eternal. And therefore we truly appreciate the frailty of wealth, that it might indeed be here today and gone tomorrow. And even if it's the wealth that we don't appreciate how frail it is, at least the frailty of life we can appreciate. And we certainly know, and certainly us in the knowing the way we Jewish people have a custom and a tradition of burial, that no matter how much the person is worth in life, when he goes on a, that final journey, he wears the same tachrichim, the same shrouds as anybody else and the same simple pine coffin as anybody else, he doesn't take that wealth with him. And a person who hasn't donated to tzedakah in his lifetime, that money stops. It doesn't go with him on that final journey. And it certainly doesn't live on. But the individual who takes that money, and who contributes it and donates it to institutions, to tzedakah, or the individual who may not have the money to donate, but who invests his time and his energy, his abilities and his skills to facilitate the development and the growth of an institution, of a community. And that they take with them in the world to come. And that is the greatest investment that we can make. And therefore the import of giving tzedakah must be seen beyond the spectrum of being kind to others, but indeed actually being very kind to ourselves. Because by giving, we're actually receiving. We're receiving a blessing not only in this world, but indeed in the world to come. And that is precisely what the Orach Chaim HaKadosh was telling us when the Jewish people came after all that time and they made a reckoning. How much were they worth? Every single Jew had left Egypt with an abundance of wealth. Where is that today? Are we the beneficiaries of that tremendous material wealth that they had? Certainly not. But we definitely are the beneficiaries of the Mishkan, of the Tabernacle. And albeit, unfortunately, today we don't know where all that has been hidden, and we don't know where the Holy Ark is, and the Menorah, and so on and so forth, but it is there. 
and those souls who contributed in those days to the building of the tabernacle and its vessels continue to reap the benefits. And that is why it says, Eilep Kudai, this, the donations and the contributions which the Jewish people made is the only true accounting of their value and their worth on a material financial level. And it carries such a powerful and potent message for us today. We live in a world where we're all trying to accumulate more possessions, more wealth, more financial security and stability. For what? For a future that we don't know may even exist. And therefore we have to gather that money, not for ourselves in this world, but for ourselves in the world to come by giving it to others in this world. The Talmud relates of a king who in years of famine opened up the storehouses that his predecessors had filled with wealth over generations and he dispensed it out to all the poor people. And his family came and said, you're, you're destroying the family treasure. Your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, they all treated their funds very carefully to ensure that you would have. And rather than you for continuing in their way and growing this stash of money, you're just ruining everything. You're giving it all away. And he said, no, I'm not. He says, they created and they stored it, but for what? To what end? Just to increase the treasure house. I am giving it away. That's true. I'm emptying out the storehouse. But I'm making an investment for the world to come. My friends, we have to make those similar investments. We have to make sure that we make our contributions. Because ultimately that's the only true measure, not only of our kindness and our piety, but it's the only true measure of our wealth. And whilst stars might not recognize it, in Shomayim in heaven it's recognized. In this world it's recognized by the gratitude of the recipients. So let us make sure that we do a correct financial accounting of our lives and not simply one that is acceptable in a financial world. Good job, this.